I'd like to begin by expressing my uh, gratitude, first and foremost to the Tr Strom Center for Jewish Studies, uh, under the direction of Professor Noam Pianko, as well as the Jackson School of International Studies, uh, under the direction of Professor Rashad Kassaba for their leadership and for their vision and for making Sephardic studies such an integral component of what is taking place at the Schramm Center for Jewish Studies and at the University of Washington um, more generally. Um, it's really transformed the University of Washington as one colleague uh, at another university told me into one of the only places where you can really engage with Jewish studies, meaning not only the Ashkenazi experience, but also the Sephardic experience. And we look forward to continuing to develop all of the angles of our Jewish studies program. I'd also like to recognize the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Robert Stacy, who's with us here also this evening, for his continued support and interest and dedication to Sephardic studies and to our broader uh, enterprises here in the Strom Center and in the Jackson School. So much work and planning went into the making of Ladino Day. A lot of uh, things behind the scenes and a lot of activity, and I'm really very grateful to the staff of the Strom Center, uh, including Dana, Emily, Hannah, Doria, Lauren, Kara, and Ty al Um I'd also like to thank Larry, uh, our sound guy, this evening. I'd also like to extend an extra special thank you to our community co-sponsors, Congregation Ezra Besarot, Sephardic Bikor Holim, the Seattle Sephardic Network, and the Sephardic Brotherhood of Seattle. Seattle is really such a lively center of Sephardic life due to all the activities that these various institutions undertake. And these institutions have also been wonderful partners for us as we've developed our Sephardic Studies program. And I'm very grateful for the interest and support of the leaders and the members of all of those organizations. There are some flyers about those organizations outside um, in the front there. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to Albert Maiman, who played a special role in uh, developing the concept for tonight's uh, Ladino Day, Adelantre. A thanks also to one of our PhD students, Molly Fitzmorris, who helped pioneer Ladino Day from the onset a few years ago. And she continues her research into Ladino. And if you speak Ladino, or if you grew up in a Ladino-speaking home, uh, Molly would like to speak with you about your experiences and about the language. And there are some flyers outside. She's also in attendance, and I'm sure she'd be happy to speak to anybody who might be interested. Sephardic Studies and Ladino Day is also made possible by the support we receive from our community, from you, and especially from the members of our Sephardic Studies Founders Circle, including the Almos, Ben Oliles, Francos, Galantes, and Lots, as well as the Al Hadith Foundation. It's thanks to our community that the Strom Center has become home to one of the most acclaimed Sephardic Studies programs in the country, and as some of my colleagues abroad tell me, also in the world. We look forward to continuing our work into the future, and we remain grateful for all the support that members of our community have provided and continue to provide. Merci mucho. Tonight, we are also indebted to the support from a new endowment in memory of Lucy Benvenista Kavish, who passed away last year, just over a year ago, on November 19th, 2015. And in the program, you could see her uh, photograph on the back page. It was a real pleasure for me to get to know Lucy over the years. She was very proud of her Sephardic and Rodizli heritage, and she loved to chat in Ladino and also French. And she used to recall many stories from her youth, from the old country, from the Belgian Congo where she was born. And she always had a new resource, a new piece of information to share with me about Los Muestros, about our communities. She was also a member of the Ladineros group, about whom you'll hear a little bit more later, and she's participated, she participated in previous Ladino Day celebrations. We were all saddened by her passing, and we remain grateful to her husband, Elliot. Uh, Elliot is here with us this evening, um, who has honored Lucy through his support for Sephardic studies through this endowment. And I couldn't really imagine a better way to honor Lucy. Que su alma repose en paz. We were also saddened by the recent death of another one of our Ladineros, Irv Adado. Irv brought so much pizzazz and humor to the group. He was a great storyteller and one of the most fluent Ladino speakers in town. 
he is sorely missed. And Ghana then is there. Ladino Day was established by the National Authority for Ladino in Jerusalem with the aim of setting aside just one day a year to celebrate and delve into Ladino language and culture. A language and culture that, even according to UNESCO, is highly endangered. And it's also a language and culture that is often excluded from the stories that we tell about our cultures and about our communities around the world. The goal of Ladino Day, the goal of tonight, is to change that, at least for an evening, to bring Ladino to the forefront of our consciousness and to hopefully carry that with us into the future. This year's, this year's Ladino Day involves film, discussion, song, and food. It could perhaps only be improved with the addition of some raki, but uh, that unfortunately won't be happening this evening. Uh, we will begin with the screening of a clip of a film called Song of the Sephardi, set here in Seattle in the 70s. And as you'll see, it definitely looks like it was the 70s. <laughs> the screening will be followed by a conversation among multiple generations of members of the Seattle Sephardic community, some of whom appeared in the film, including Isaac Azos, Judy Amiel, and David Bihar. And we'll discuss the past, the present, and the future of Ladino and Sephardic culture in Seattle and beyond. We'll also be joined by a younger member of the, of the community, McKenna Owens, who will also offer her perspective, having been uh, not born at the time that the film was created. The discussion will be followed by a brief Q&A, and to conclude, the Ladineros will sing with us and for us, and we'll invite you to participate, two of the songs that are featured in the film. We'll conclude with a kosher reception upstairs in the Walker Ames uh, room, and there are stairways and uh, elevators outside. Now, a few words about the film, Song of the Sephardi. It began as a dream in the imagination of the director, David Raphael, who was a graduate of the University of Washington Medical School, Medical School. And as a student, he was here in Seattle in the 70s, and he became ensconced in the local Sephardic community, even though he himself was not Sephardic. He became very enamored and fell in love with the people and the customs and the traditions, and he realized that there had never really been a film that had ever been made documenting the Sephardic experience and the Ladino language. So he decided that it would be his job to try to fill that gap. Remember, he is a medical, he is a doctor, not a filmmaker. But it was through the creation of this film that he decided to focus on the power of song and its ability to tell the story of the Sephardic Jews. Since he was in Seattle and saw Seattle as a vibrant center of Sephardic life, he set much of the film here. And another part of the film, which we won't be watching today, is set in Israel, which is where uh, he lives now. The film premiered here in Seattle in 1978. Now we are nearly 40 years later, and we'll be revisiting the film. We will reflect on the snapshot of Sephardic culture that the film captured, and follow the protagonists of the film until today. Where are they now? Some of them are here in this room. And what is the present status of Ladino culture and Sephardic community life here in Seattle? What does the future have in store? Are there more verses to the song of the Sephardi yet to be composed? There's a Ladino refrain or proverb that goes, no hay cantadores, no hay sintadores. And there are many interpretations of this. Literally means there are not singers, there are not listeners. But one of the interpretations is that really, if there is nobody to listen, there really won't be anybody to sing. So maybe we have a little bit of good news which is because we have all of us convened here together, so at least we have some sintadores. Does anybody here know anybody who is in the film? <laughs> okay, all right, just curious. So uh, Hazan Ezos, he was the one leading the Passover Seder with the pretty snazzy uh, shirt. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, Judy Amiel is uh, a longtime member of the Sephardic Bikor Holim in Seattle, and her father was pictured reading uh, from the Torah 
uh, his name was Reverend Benaroya, and he brought with him and uh, transmitted a lot of the traditional ways of chanting in the Sephardic um, uh, traditions. Her family was from Izmir, and uh, Judy was, uh, excuse me, Edirne, pardon me, pardon me, Edirne, um, and uh, came he here via, uh, via Switzerland. Right, that's right, okay. And um, I'd like to also welcome uh, David Bihar, who is a longtime member, uh, well, since you were you were born into the congregation, uh, Ezra Besarot, and uh, he is third generation active in the community. Uh, his grandfather uh, and also his uh, father were important leaders in the community, and David continues uh, in those traditions. Um, and it's a pleasure to have him with us as well. And finally, we have uh, McKenna uh, Owens, who was not in the film. Um, <laughs> She is a native of Seattle and a graduate of uh, Northwest Yeshiva High School. Her um, maternal grandparents were from the city of Salonika, and she is now uh, studying Jewish studies in, uh, uh, in New York at Yeshiva University. And I have to say that as a gr an undergraduate, we conducted an independent study together uh, in Sephardic history, Ladino, the use of Ladino in certain Sephardic prayer books. And I'm pleased to report that it won the award for the best essay in Jewish history at uh, Stern College. So that was, that was a pretty nice, uh, nice accomplishment. So thank you all for being here, and thanks for uh, taking some time to speak with us for a few moments. Um, I, I thought first maybe we would have your reflections about the film. Um, whoever would like to start, what, what do you think the most significant aspect of the film was for you looking back now or looking maybe for one of the first times at the film? What really sticks with you? What is the most memorable or important piece of the film? Well, I can say that uh, my family, as you saw, was in the film and we did the Passover scene and it took place at the home of Dr. Raphael and his wife Esther in North Hollywood, California. And, and it was scheduled to start at 8 o'clock on a Sunday evening. And uh, my late wife, Lily, and, uh, and Esther Raphael had spent hours in preparing the meal that we were going to eat after the filming. And uh, they invited us all, all there to have uh, dinner at the end. And uh, most, I think, everybody in the, in the scene was uh, my family. Mom and dad were there, my, some of my kids were there, my brothers, uh, my late brother David, my late sister Selma were there as well. And um, let's see if I can remember, we didn't even get started till almost nine o'clock. But because of so many distractions, uh, they couldn't get the scene just right because they heard extraneous noises from planes flying overhead and so forth. And uh, we didn't finish the scene until about one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but there was uh, something, an, an event that took place that evening, which was very hilarious, which was, you're probably aware that uh, back in those days of movie making, they had the one that's uh, going to, the head of filming the scene, maybe the director, that has something called a clap board. That's a board that has a hinge and it, you slam it down on the board and it's got the, movie, the name of the movie and the take that you're doing and so forth. And um, the person, I guess it was Dr. Raphael, that slammed it for the first time, slammed it so hard that my mother shot up three feet in the air and said, Adio Santo! <laughs> we all got a very big kick out of that and uh, <laughs> kept us laughing for a long time. But as I said, it went till one o'clock in the morning uh, before we actually sat down to eat and nobody was really hungry by that time. <laughs> That's what I remember most from that. Great, thank you. Would, would somebody like, Judy, would you like to share? Uh, uh, Mr. Azos, thank you. What, first of all, what impressed me, or what really sort of made me remember so well, all those faces that are no longer with us and it just brought back so many memories, personal memories, and also the vibrancy of the community at the time where these people were living. And, and, and that's what touched me most, more than anything when I see this. Um, what can I say? 
Um, I do. I have my own microphone. Oh, by the way, David was the one with the afro and the mustache, the father, <laughs> the baby. Thank you for pointing that out, Hazan Aziz. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my, my first impression um, actually is, from seeing it tonight, is that my cousin, David Sam Bihar, who was the young man that was courting the, the girl on the bike and whose mother didn't, uh, didn't cotton to him much, um, I, is a much better actor than I am. I can, <laughs> that's, that's pretty apparent. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it brings back a lot of memories. Um, the other thing that struck me is um, to see myself there with my father. You know, that's, uh, that's close to 40 years ago. And um, it's it, my father recently passed away, and it's really wonderful to see because I hadn't seen the movie in a long time, and I just glanced at it before tonight to uh, just refamiliarize myself with it. But it's very nice to see myself there with my father. Um, I would point out one other thing that's that I think is unique. Uh, you may have noticed in the last scene, the crowd entering the hall. It may have looked familiar to you because they're entering Kane Hall. Right? Did anybody notice? It looked, it looked a lot like the room and the building we're in. The room is different, actually, and that, that film, which was... I, I think it was Meany, wasn't it? It was, it was Kane was Hall. Was it Kane? It was Kane Hall. It was Kane 120, this room. This room? This room. And I'll tell you how I know that. I so. That was three years, actually, prior to the release of the film. The film was released, I believe, in 1978. So um, I was a senior at the UW, and David and Esther Raphael, David was doing his residency, I believe, here at that time. And um, uh, he and Esther called me and asked me to, if I would take a leadership role in forming a Sephardic students organization on campus, and he, their objective was that we would put on a Sephardic cultural week. That uh, crowd entering this room um, was entering this room on December 6th, 1975, okay? Well, I, I remember because I uh, actually, uh, on December 6th, which is just a few days from now, it'll be 41 years, and I introduced Riv Karaz. I was very involved, actually. We put on a, a complete week of Sephardic activities. We formed a Sephardic student organization, and we put on a week of events that culminated with that concert. And so that comes back to me very vividly, and it was, uh, it was an exciting time. And uh, uh, so the concert was incredible. There were like 500 people here. It w the room wasn't laid out like this at the time. Great. Th thank you, David. McKenna, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, did, did, that, did the film seem familiar? Did it seem like a different world to you, or was it? So <clears throat> aside from the, the clothes, <laughs> And the overall lack of tall buildings um, in downtown. <laughs> um, what I thought was so incredible is that there was so much about the songs and especially synagogue that was the same. And actually, I watched the film um, in New York before I came here. And after I watched it, I, sh I was showing parts of it to my friends. And I was like, do you want to know what it's like in Seattle? It's just like this. And synagogue is really just the same. Um, and some of the things, songs that we sing on Pesach are also just the same. Um, especially also like Yako Mimos, like on Shabbat, we still do that. Um, and I thought that was so amazing. And I thought that in that way, the film really, I thought, did the community such justice because it brought to life all these beautiful aspects. And I think that knowing that those things are still true today um, is really amazing. So yeah, it did feel very familiar. That's, that's a really fascinating point because, you know, one of the sort of the concluding line of the section that we, we, we watched um, Dr. Raphael, or whoever the narrator is, is making a point, you know, that the, the candles are, you know, flickering. The one had blown out, and, you know, he seems to suggest that the, the wind has fallen out of the sails of the, of the Sephardic community a little bit here in Seattle. So it's really interesting for you to see, at least in the space of the synagogue, uh, it seems that some of those traditions and the Ladino language has been preserved, which is a perfect segue to my next question, which is to think about a little bit more. In what ways do you think, McKenna's already answered that question a little bit, in what ways have Sephardic customs or Ladino, the language specifically, has it been preserved or kept alive until today? And in what ways do you see it uh, dissipating or going in different directions? 
Well, if I can. Yeah, sure, please. Getting back to the movie, I think the movie itself has done a lot to preserve the customs, the traditions, the ceremonies, and a few of the songs, uh, the uh, Ladino songs for the community. But remember when we're talking about so the song of the Sephardi, we're really talking about Ladino-speaking Sephardic Jews. The, there are other Sephardic Jews as well that uh, belong to what is called in Hebrew Edot Amizrach, the communities of the East, or the Middle Eastern Jews, if you will. Those are from the countries like uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and don't forget the North African countries like Morocco and uh, Libya and uh, uh, Egypt, of course. I'm missing Algeria, I guess. Um, and uh, they have nothing to do with Ladino, but there is a version of Ladino called Haketia, which they speak in the North African communities, which is very like, very similar to Ladino. And they're trying to preserve it. I'm not sure that it's going anywhere right now. Um, I think the Ladino culture it continues to thrive. However, the Ladino language is something that unfortunately is not pre being preserved as much or used as much as, it depends on the generation of course, but let's say my generation, uh, I can still converse a little bit of Ladino with some of my friends or my contemporaries and, but it's with a struggle that we try very, very hard to find the words where before it depended on, on your family, on the family that, you know, many of the grandparents lived with the family and therefore the grandchildren picked up the Ladino and, and uh, understand it and continue to speak it and that's something tremendous. We don't have that today. And that saddens me a little bit that um, even, even with my own grandchildren, I mean, they're curious. How do you say this in Latino, Noni? Or, and, and I answer as best as I can, but nevertheless, they're not understanding the culture. That's up to the parents to teach them. As Judy said, um, the Latino language is really not um, first language to virtually anyone anymore. Um, I feel privileged to have witnessed the first immigrants from the old country and to have seen you know, people and homes that had Ladino as a first language. But you know, those days are gone, and I don't think they're coming back. Um, the good news, I think, is that um, just kind of segueing from that uh, impression that I had of, you know, just a few years before the film was released, that event that we had, we formed a, a small organization and we put on one program. It was a great program, but it was one program, okay? Today we have uh, Dr. Nahar, Pro Professor Nahar, you know, uh, the head of a Sephardic studies program at the University of Washington. Sephardic studies is a part of the University of Washington curriculum. We never would have dreamed you know, in 1975, that that would be a reality. It's amazing. Um, we probably never would have really dreamed that Hazan Azuz and Joel Ben Aliel would have produced, probably for the first time since the early 20th century, published an Ottoman Ladino tradition uh, set of, of prayer books for daily Sabbath, all the holidays. That hasn't happened, I think, since the turn of the century that they were publishing books like that. And those were actually probably reprints of older versions. Um, you know, with the help of people like Hazan Azuz, I've learned and others have learned at least the liturgical usage of Ladino. And that continues in the synagogues, I think in a, in a way that's just as strong as, you know, four decades ago, maybe even stronger. So, you know, the, there's been a significant assimilation. There have been significant losses but on the other hand, we've, we've got some real strengths. Thank you, David. And, and for McKenna, what, what, is, what is your take? I mean, you mentioned, a number of people have mentioned that the synagogues have been spaces for the preservation of Ladino. Maybe David even says maybe the strengthening and maybe even more interest in some ways. 
can you comment about your experience outside of the synagogue and do you see some of that Ladino activated in the in your the world the milieu you grew up in in Seattle? Yeah. So also, I just want to like add to what people were saying. My grandparents also spoke Ladino, so I also grew up hearing it, but I didn't understand it. Um, I didn't even know that they were speaking Ladino up until a certain point. I asked my mom. I was like, "What are they speaking?" And she was like, "It's Ladino. Like, how do you not know?" Um, but um, but for me, um, it was not something I learned. It's not something that my mom knows either. Um, but what I think has, just like David was saying, what I think has been really important is to kind of legitimize the language in an academic context. I think that for me personally, that was a really good way to get me more interested in learning the language and understanding the importance of the language. Um, because when it's brought to the, to the forefront, like in a university setting, it really gets people to pay attention and say, oh my God, like this is something that is really at the heart of Sephardic culture, at Sephardic Judaism, and we need to preserve it so that it doesn't get lost. So as Dr. Nar was saying at the beginning, when I did this research project, I was looking at Sudurim and I was looking not at the Hebrew, because that I could read, I was looking at the translation into Ladino. And I was like struggling through it the whole summer trying to figure it out. And I was like, it would be so great if I could just one day look at this and it wouldn't be such a struggle and I could really know what this means. Um, and actually also that same summer, Al Maimon gave me a book um, called Parashas de la Semana, and it's like Divre Torah on the weekly Torah portion written in Ladino. And I really do hope that one day I can look through that book um, and understand what it's talking about. But, um, oh, another thing I was thinking about also is that I think that in the movie we saw, they were talking about Ma'am Loez, um, which is the Ladino, um, I guess, like commentary um, on the Torah. And today, like in the Bet Midrash where I'm at school, like we're not learning Ma'am Loez. Um, but again, that's something that I would like to do. So from a religious perspective, again, I think that understanding the, like where like Ma'am Loez was coming from, um, you can really only understand it, I feel like, if you read it in the original, original Ladino. So. Do you think there would be opportunities to integrate that into the kind of curricula, into the kinds of studies that you do? Or? I think that on an individual level, yes. Um, I think that to do it on an institutional level would be a lot more difficult, but it would be a nice goal to keep in mind, but I think it needs to start with individuals. I just have a comment, and uh, it's a question that I ask myself all the time. How did we come about understanding Ladino to begin with, it, at least from my generation? It's true that my parents spoke a little bit of it at home, but that's only to hide certain things that I wouldn't <laughs> be able to understand. But guess what? <laughs> I, but that's how I learned. Yeah. That's how I learned it. And so I, I also do my best to try to involve my, my grandsons because they take Spanish at school or and sometimes they'll ask me, how do you say this and this in Ladino, Noni? And I, and I tell them, and I said, well, that's interesting that you're interested in how this goes. And so in order to perpetuate the, the language, I think I have to be a little more forthcoming with them and, and tell them a little bit more about what it is and how I learned it, and et cetera, et cetera. But I, I wish they could uh, pick up a little more. Great, thank you. I will, uh, just due to time, we'll maybe just move to our final question, okay. if that's okay, and then we'll open it up for, for more conversation, which is, we, we were already in, in that direction, but I mean, could, could you each comment a little bit more on what you think the future, what is the future fate of, of Ladino as a language or Sephardic culture more generally? To return to my earlier kind of question, are there, will there be more verses written to the song of the Sephardi, or is that song really done and we're in a, in a new domain? Um, so maybe you could comment on that. I'd just like to ask maybe David to start first, because unfortunately he has to <coughs> excuse himself. Uh, he has to catch a flight. No Thank emergency. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, well, um, I, I think that, that uh, and, and actually I didn't want to be a Hadrozu, right? <laughs> But, Can you tell us what but, you mean by that? But I had so many thoughts about the topics that Professor Nahr gave us that I wrote them down. And um, uh, I'm just going to, on the future topic, I'm going to read something that I wrote. Um, but I just want to say that, that um, the, the one item that 
there's so many things to discuss. It's really, we could spend a night, you know, just discussing, but the cataloging that. of those, of all these, we were talking about the old books and you were talking about the old uh, holy books that, that we can study. Um, to have them now all scanned, all the treasures, uh, the, you know, and, and being able to access them now online, the tremendous amount of work that you did, that your, you know, uh, your staff and you did, is, uh, you know, puts at your fingertips so many things. So uh, I guess I would say the f in terms of the future, I'm going to read you something that I wrote here, that, that um, Sephardic culture... The, the folk uh, kind of ways that we're talking about. It's a beautiful, ornate, lyrical, delicious delivery system through which we can access a timeless, profound, and meaningful way of life, a transcendental philosophy, a societal paradigm, and a belief system. So I really think that you know, this beautiful culture that we have is such an, uh, an attractive entry point to access the depth of our Jewish tradition and our Sephardic, particularly our perspective as Sephardic Jews to the Jewish tradition. And I think to the extent that we can preserve it and, and make it our own, it'll never be what our grandparents had, but it can be something new and something special. And I commend you for everything you're doing to make that happen. And so many people in the community, in so many organizations and individuals are working together to try to make that happen. I think it's exciting. Great, thank you, David. So you can, yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, David, would, would somebody else like I, to? Uh, I wanted to come? say that uh, for me, unlike Judy, Ladino was my first language at home. It's what I spoke with my mother and father when I was born in July 1930. And it wasn't until after I went to school and came home speaking English that I forced them to learn English and speak with me in English. But that Ladino has stayed with me through all these years. Now, if I, I don't know if the timeline is right, but I believe that it was my uncle Isaac Maimon that led a class in Ladino at the Sephardic Bikur Halim. I think it was in the mid to late 80s and early 90s. If anybody knows better, they can correct me. And uh, he actually went through uh, conjugating verbs and sentences and so forth. And then uh, after he passed on, Hazan Arya Greenberg, on my retirement from congregation as a Reseret, in, uh, it was on January 1st of 2000, he decided to start a class in Ladino teaching Mam Luez. Uh, but of course, that's done in Rashi characters, Hebrew Rashi characters, and not too many people were able to follow that, so he would read and translate for the people in the class. I think Menashe Israel, who's here tonight, was one of those members in, in that class. And when he left, uh, he, re he didn't retire, but he decided he didn't want to do that any longer. He went back to New York. We had Rabbi Solomon Quinn Scully, who was at, uh, as the rabbi at uh, Ezra Baserath at the time, and he took over Aryeh's class, but he left a couple of years later, and I decided to take over the class then, but I took it on a different course. Rather than continuing with Mam Loez, I wanted to have participation from everybody in the class, and the class has grown from I think I took it over at about eight people, and uh, we've got 24 on our list. We don't always get 24 to come to our weekly sessions, maybe 18, between 18 and 20 or so. And um, what I did was to take story, I downloaded stories in Ladino. I'd break them up into paragraphs of uh, three to four sentences, and we go around the room, and everybody takes a crack at reading in Ladino and translating what it is that they're reading, if they don't know, everybody's willing to jump in and let them know what they think. So um, if I can go on for a minute now as to what I think the future is, I don't hold out, hold out a lot of hope for the, for the future. We've got the class of Ladineros. Uh, we're gonna go on as long as we possibly can, but we're all an aging group, really, with just a very few that are in the 50 to 60 year old category. I know that they're doing a lot more around the U.S., like uh, Brian Kirshen did at UCLA, where they have uh, seminars every year, and they bring in people from the outside, and they have a Sephardic film festival, and they also have uh, a class such as what we have here in southern Florida. I'm not sure what it is, but they seem to be very successful. Uh, I don't hold out a lot of hope for the future. I think the future itself is going to be in Israel 
where they've got hundreds if not thousands of people that are involved in Ladino and they put on musical programs where people attend and sing and, and uh, they have a marvelous time. They even have an organization there uh, uh, of Turkish Jews, I think it's called Arkadash if I'm not mistaken. And they are doing amazing, amazing things. So I think, so I think any future is going to come from academia plus a big, big population in Israel. Great, thank you, Hazan Hezoz. Judy? I just have one comment. Ladino saved my social life, believe it or not. Because when I came to the United States, I was 10 years old, I came with my parents. I knew no English, I knew French only, and that was it. And the only way that I could communicate with my Ladino de nada, I just, it, it saved me socially. So I tried to find friends who understood me, but that doesn't mean that I was speaking proper, <laughs> proper Ladino. But that's how, we, how I communicated with them. And the more I did, the, more it, the easier it became for me to start to become a little more open and to speak a little easier and so on and so forth. But it really did. It saved my social life. Could I ask a follow-up question with regard to your grandchildren? You mentioned that they're, they're getting interested a little bit in Ladino. What role do you think Ladino will play in their lives as they grow up? I don't think that it will. Mm -hmm. Do you think they'll have some vocabulary words that they'll well, use around sure, the house? Well, for sure, they already do. Okay, they already they integrate already some Ladino into their English. Yeah, but I can't mm -hmm. tell you what the words are. <laughs> uh -huh. so. But no, they're interested. They are interested. And uh, so whenever I have the opportunity, I do try to engage them a little bit. So Thank you, Judy. Mm -hmm. McKenna, what are your thoughts? I guess my perspective is more optimistic <laughs> in a way. I don't know if that's naive, but um, I think that at least like amongst my friends, like a lot of us live in New York, we're not among people who are Sephardic like us. We're amongst like Syrian Jews and Persian Jews. And we all have like this really amazing love and appreciation for the type of Sephardic Jews that we are. And so I think that that is something that I still see. Like, I mean, if you're saying that your kids are, your grandkids are interested, I think that that's something that's still there. And I think that even something, I don't know if people think it's insignificant, but even something as kids in Sephardic Adventure Camp are still learning Yakomimos and like they still know all the words, you know? And I think that they're gonna remember the words and they're gonna teach their kids the words. And I think that to the extent that Ladino can be something that people from my generation can think about and think of home and think of their, like, their type of Sephardic Judaism, I think that that is a success, in my opinion. Um, the other thing that I just wanna say regarding um, like Ladineros, Hazan, you were mentioning that a lot of people in the group are getting older. I'm wondering if maybe um, some kind of like summer sort of like maybe mini Ladineros for people who are maybe my age who are not around Seattle during the year and can't participate um, could be potentially successful. If you need someone to bother people, I'm good at that. <laughs> but, um, but really, I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of us are not, we don't live in the community at this point, specific point in time. Hopefully some of us will come back, but um, there could be opportunities for summertime to get more people in like my generation involved. I think it's a, I think it's a strong possibility. I appreciate the, the optimism. I mean, I think if we're, if we're looking to revive Ladino, I mean, there's some talk, you know, like Ladino is a dead language. Can you revive it? Um, where it will be an all-encompassing language that will be spoken in the, not only used for liturgical purposes, but, you know, spoken when you're in the synagogue or spoken at home, spoken on the streets. You'll be singing it in the shower. Maybe that's more realistic, actually. But that's probably very unlikely. You know, so some scholars speak about language, not, not fluency, but rather language infusion. So maybe we could be thinking about a, 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 a Sephardic infused universe where different aspects of one's life in the synagogue, at home, on the streets may be infused with a language, a little bit of Ladino flavor. Maybe that's something that could be realistic to perpetuate for some time forward. Maybe if we do get some more people interested in a, in a summer program or other kind of program, uh, which would be great to do, maybe those avenues and those spaces would, it, would it continue to increase. I'd like to invite McKenna and her group, whoever they are, to our summer, summer picnic we have every year. I've got some people in mind. <laughs> um, 
Great. So uh, we have time for just uh, just two questions, two or three questions. So if anybody would like to ask a question, what we can do is you can come to the, uh, the side of the um, of the aisle, and uh, and we'll have some microphones there, and you can ask those questions. So it's a great question. I mean, I think it goes back to the uh, the refrain. I think in some ways that I mentioned at the beginning: No, I cantadores, no, I sintadores. If there's not if we don't have people who say, we want to learn the language, we want to teach our kids the language, we want to perpetuate the language, it's not going to happen. So I think the first thing that is absent right now is a kind of a critical mass. You know, I mean, I'm trying an experiment right now. I mean, I have a, a, a son who was born last Ladino Day, and he, you know, he's now a year old, and I'm trying to speak to him as much as I can in Ladino and sing to him in Ladino. Actually, the Ladinero is very generously dedicated That's quite a number great. of months to uh, translating uh, Little Red Riding Hood into Ladino because there's not, <laughs> there's not uh, really an extensive amount of, uh, of information, of stories that are available in, uh, in Ladino. But then again, here I am. I'm a heritage speaker of Ladino. In other words, I did not grow up speaking the language. I grew up hearing the language and not, really, not even really understanding um, and it's a language that I started learning later, speaking with my, uh, with my grandfather and other relatives living in a Ladino-speaking community in Greece. But here in Seattle, I feel like if I want, if my, if my partner and I want our kid to learn Ladino, it's going to require uh, more than just us in the household, you know, doing it. And um, it would be an experiment to see if, if something like that could, uh, could happen. But... Um, Without the without the critical mass, I'm not sure. I mean, I can bring him to the to the ladineros once a week, or I can <laughs> compel the ladineros to come and babysit and speak to him in uh, in, in in Ladino. And uh, ulterior motive, <laughs> right? Yeah, ulterior motive, of course. Um, I don't know. Does, does anybody else have a thought about that? Um, so I guess something that I think about is that just because I guess like I'm in school now and was just also in college and high school, um, a lot of the thought I think of what goes into, okay, what are we gonna teach kids is like what's gonna be the most useful. So it's like, okay, they need to learn Spanish because you put that on your resume and you can have any job in the world. But the question is, why do they need to learn Ladino? So, I mean, it's, to, I mean, you know, you could make an argument that I think we all find compelling, which is this is our heritage, this is our culture, like this is us, of course they have to know it. But to, you know, to the board of academics, you know, looking at their college applications, maybe it's not so relevant. So I think that's also the issue is that in a school setting where these, where like that's really where learning a language would really truly come from, um, I don't think that it's seen as something that's necessary compared to all the other things that the school has to prioritize to teach. I just wanted to say that I enjoy our weekly Ladineros class so much. I very much look forward to going every single Tuesday from 10.30 in the morning till noon. It's about an hour and a half. And I think uh, all of those that come as well truly enjoy that class as well. And uh, as long as I'm alive and feeling up to it, I'm going to continue as, as long as I can. Could I add just one other, one other comment, maybe to follow up on McKenna's comment, which is the question of the utility of the language. It's a really good question. It's a dying language. It's a language that's not used on an everyday basis. But perhaps there is some utility to it, because this was an argument, actually, that was made by Ladino activists about 100 years ago when they already felt maybe Ladino was not going to survive into modern times, because whatever the, the language of the country they were living was going to take over, or in their Jewish context, Hebrew was going to take over. But there were a few activists who argued there's something special about Ladino, which is that Ladino is a language that builds bridges. It's a language that is based in Spanish and other Iberian dialects, but that also has a Jewish and a Hebrew component that grew up and flourished in an Islamic context in the Muslim world of the Ottoman Empire and incorporated vocabulary from Turkish and from Greek and from Arabic. And then in modern times, it also brought in uh, vocabulary and elements from French and from Italian and in the American context, English. And there was one guy who went traveling around Europe and he was surprised to discover that 
in all of the Balkans and the Middle East and into Europe, he was able to at least make some kind of connection with the people he met mm. through his knowledge of Ladino because even though he didn't necessarily originally know it, he knew already a little bit of all of the languages of the people with whom he came into contact. So if there's a way to maybe to capitalize on that and to think about, especially in our world today, where we think about Jews and Muslims, we think of them on polar opposites, but now you have a language that really came of age in a Muslim world and in which there are some you know, immediate links, or with the Spanish-speaking world, which is a huge contingency, there are links there. And maybe that's a, a, a place or a, a, a realm for, for exploration and discovery and an opportunity to reclaim the language to some extent. <laughs> Judy, oh, did you want to add sure. something? No, I'm, I'm just saying that, uh, I, I'm just thinking that through the Ladino program, through the University of Washington, through other places on different campuses, that they're trying to incorporate the Ladino or Spanish-speaking uh, programs, etc. I think that's a, a way to preserve it and find some students who might be interested. And that's the only way that it's gonna it's gonna continue being alive, so to speak. Because I don't think people are looking to to uh, speak it. Um, it. It's very difficult to be interested in a language that's not really a, a language for other cultures except for our own. Great, thank yeah. you, thank you, Judy, and thank you for that question. Um, we will, let's give a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs>